Hi, and welcome to lesson four here in our unit on kinetics, thermodynamics, and equilibrium. And we're actually going to move to equilibrium right now. So here you see the double arrow, and that double arrow is gonna be really important in chemistry. Anytime you see that, that means that we're talking about a situation that exists at equilibrium. Let's go in and take a look at what this means. So we've talked about equilibrium before in our class, but equilibrium is just a rate of balance between two opposing changes. The rate of the forward change is equal to the rate of the reverse change. Equilibrium is not restricted to chemistry. So here are two jugglers. If those jugglers are successfully juggling these pins back and forth, they are in an equilibrium. The rate at which they catch pins is equal to the rate at which they throw pins back to each other. As long as they continue to do this, they can continue to juggle as much as they want. You will see equilibrium in all sorts of systems in all sorts of places in your life. What we're talking about here are just the specific chemistry examples that we should pay attention to. In order to get a handle on equilibrium, we should talk about a little bit of terminology. The first is this notion of forward and reverse processes. So here's a forward reaction. If I reverse the direction of that arrow and swap the products and reactants, we've got a reverse reaction. We can actually represent both of these at equilibrium by using a double arrow. In this case, going from the material on the left to the material on the right is the forward reaction, and going from the material on the right to the material on the left is the reverse reaction. We only use this double arrow when these two opposing reactions exist at equilibrium. Equilibrium has several general properties that are true in whatever situation we're talking about. Let's talk about those properties and how they specifically relate to chemistry. The first property of equilibrium is that it's a dynamic situation, which means that the forward and reverse reactions are occurring simultaneously. Now, when we're looking at chemical reactions, we're talking about so many atoms reacting in both directions, because atoms are so small, that it will seem like nothing is happening to us at the big macro level. But don't be fooled. If you could look at the atomic level, you'd see that there were actually millions and millions and millions of reactions occurring in both directions simultaneously. Since the rate of those two reactions is the same, the amount of the substance that we have will seem like it's not changing all that much. But of course, it is changing. It's just changing at a microscopic level. This simulation is going to get at this point. We're going to set up a situation in this simulation where we have 20 molecule A's and 20 molecule B's simultaneously in this reaction chamber. We've got a graph that shows the current amounts of each substance, and we've also got a diagram that shows that we put in more energy than we need in order to get both the forward and reverse reactions to occur. Once we start, take a look at the graph showing the current amounts. It will be somewhat hard to see what's happening in the reaction chamber because everything's going to be moving so quickly. You'll see that initially we start out of equilibrium, but then eventually we do get to an equilibrium. Let's take a look and see how that works. So there we go to start. And you can see now we've basically reached an equilibrium. But notice that even at this equilibrium, we do get some fluctuation back and forth in the total amount of, this, of each substance. That's what we mean when we say it's dynamic. The reason you see this fluctuation is because we're only looking at 40 molecules. If we were looking at four moles of molecules, you wouldn't see any fluctuation at all. It would be too small to be able to measure in any meaningful way, and it would just seem like the quantities of substances were remaining the same in each case. The second property of equilibrium is that equilibrium can only happen in a closed system isolated from its surroundings. In systems thinking, we think about things as the system and the surroundings, and systems can either be closed or open. A closed system is one where nothing is being input into that system from the surroundings. Of course, there's no real thing as a perfectly closed system other than the universe itself, but for the purpose of our equilibrium discussions, we mean they're closed to inputs that affect the equilibrium. You can think about this with the jugglers. If somebody all of a sudden started throwing more pins into the juggler's system, they would quickly leave equilibrium and probably wind up getting hurt in the process. In chemistry, we're not going to be dealing with jugglers. For the most part in chemistry, our systems are going to be things like beakers, stoppered beakers into which we're not putting or removing any matter. That's a good example of a closed chemical system for the purpose of equilibrium. Our third property of equilibrium is that if you change the conditions of the equilibrium, that will change the equilibrium. So what we're going to see in this simulation is an increase in the amount of one of the molecules in the equilibrium. And you'll see that that affects the overall numbers of each of the molecules in the equilibrium after that increase is accomplished. Let's take a look. So you can see that we're increasing the amount of BC. And now we're going to leave it. And you can see that once we get to that new equilibrium, we've now got different amounts of our materials than what we started with. That is a major characteristic of any equilibrium system. If you change the conditions, you change the equilibrium. Our final property of equilibrium is that only the rates of the opposing changes have to be equal, not the amounts of substances. 
In fact, very rarely at an equilibrium will the substances be present in equal amounts. It's only the rates of change. We can think about this in terms of something like your bank account. Hopefully there's more money in your bank than there is in your wallet. But a good rule of thumb is at the very least, do not withdraw more money from your bank account than you're putting in. You want the rate of input to equal the rate of output. If you took out more money than you were putting in, you'd be out of equilibrium and start to lose money from the bank. And if you put in more money than you took out, you would not be in equilibrium either as your bank account would grow in amount. But if you kept the amount that you were putting in equal to the amount that you're taking out, then you're at equilibrium. The amount of money in your bank account is not going to change as a result. But you could have many thousands of dollars in your bank account and only a couple hundred dollars in your wallet. You would still be at equilibrium because the rate of input and output is the same. That's what the equilibrium is. It is not equal amounts, which is a common mistake that students make. There are three major kinds of equilibrium that we're going to be most, most focused on in chemistry. The first type is what's called chemical equilibrium. That's going to be easily the most common equilibrium that we'll deal with. That's where the rate of a forward chemical reaction and a reverse reaction are equal. This diagram shows you two different starting concentrations for SO3, SO2, and O2. When these reactions reach equilibrium, there's a constant unchanging concentration of each of these substances. Even though we're starting with different initial concentrations, we wind up with the same final concentrations for each substance. That's characteristic of a chemical equilibrium at a specific temperature and pressure. The second kind of equilibrium is what's called solution equilibrium. In solution equilibrium, the rate of dissolving is equal to the rate of recrystallization for a substance. This is only true for saturated solutions. Let's take a look at that in this simulation. What we're going to see here is the addition of sodium chloride crystals to water and you'll see that we have a solid sodium chloride crystal and many dissolved ions. What you're going to see in this simulation is sodium chloride crystals in water in a saturated solution. You can see that there are many, many dissolved ions and there is a large sodium chloride crystal in the middle. If we go and we look at the border of that crystal, you can see that the rate of the ions entering the solution is equal to the rate of the ions leaving the solution. That's a solution equilibrium. It only works at a saturated solution where you have both crystals and dissolved ions together in the system. And our last type of equilibrium is what's called a phase equilibrium, where the rates of two opposing phase changes are equal. We've talked about this previously in this course. This only happens at the melting and boiling point of a substance. This simulation shows water at its boiling point, and you can see that we have a phase equilibrium between the gaseous water and the liquid water. For every molecule of water that becomes a gas, one molecule of the gas water condenses back to the liquid. As long as those two rates are equal, this substance is at a phase equilibrium. If you have any questions about any of the phase equilibria that we've talked about in this lesson, you definitely want to write them down before we wrap up. Thanks so much for watching this introduction to equilibrium systems. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure that you can determine if a situation is in equilibrium. Is that double arrow present? Are we talking about a saturated solution? Are we at a substance's phase change point? If so, then we're in equilibrium. Also make sure that you can compare and contrast chemical equilibrium, solution equilibrium, and phase equilibrium, and broaden them out to the larger phenomenon of equilibrium that exists throughout the various systems of our lives and the universe at large. If you can do those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have. You can always leave them in the comments below the video and you can always get in touch with me. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.